Hey y'all. So I had the opportunity to go and listen to a talk from Miss, uh, I always say her name wrong, Candace Taylor, sorry. Candace Taylor, she wrote a book called The Overground Railroad. So this is the book. Um, it is like super thick and it is good. Like I just got it, it's so amazing. Um, so if you're wondering why I'm talking about this and why I'm putting this on our channel, uh, I wanted to talk to you about, um, why this book is so, is such an amazing book and what this has to do with all the stuff that we're doing here at Yoked. So, um, if you're following along, you know that we're doing our African ancestry project, like we're tracing our roots and I'm trying to, you know, we're both trying to find out where our ancestors came from on the continent of Africa. So... Um, part of the travel experience uh, for African Americans in this country, like the first time we traveled and had anything to do with America was when our ancestors were brought over on slave ships. And so like a lot of people, like a lot of my friends will, you know, kind of half joke about, you know, I'm not getting back on a boat because that's where, you know, our first experience with travel came from um, as part of us being a part of this country and if you don't know about it the the green book was a book that was created in i believe it was in the 30s late 20s early 30s and what it was was a way for black americans to safely travel across the united states um finding being able to find places to stay find places to get gas um and find places to eat, just like the essentials that you wouldn't think of, especially today traveling, um, because we have pretty much access to everything that we want, but that wasn't always the case. So the Green Book was something that was written to help Black Americans safely travel across the country. And this book that uh, Candace wrote called The Overground Railroad, she talks about um, the Green Book, she talks about the experiences that her stepfather had when he was a young child traveling. And the most eye-opening part of that was um, some part learning, some part um, reinforcing the things that I had heard and experienced growing up. Like how when, like in black families, you get get ready to go on the road and you pack all of this food to go on the road. And, and you know, as Miss Taylor brought up, you know, or someone in the audience brought up, we were super excited for that because we we're like, yay, we get free food in the car like we can always eat. But that tradition comes from the times when black families would have to travel and there were no restaurants that would serve them. So in order for them to not be hungry on the road, they would pack all of this food in the car. And, you know, just so many different things that we don't think are associated with um, segregation and racism in this country, but being able to understand where those different traditions came from and why they are, you know, in essence, still perpetrated to this day. Um, so what follows this is a video of Miss um, Taylor reading from the Overground Railroad, which is the book that she wrote, an excerpt of her reading from that book. And I just wanted to share it with you because definitely as we continue on with this um, African Ancestry Project, we are going to be, you know, doing a lot of traveling and discussing, you know, how travel and migration and all of those things impact who we are as a people and where we've come from and where we hope to go in the future. So I hope you enjoy it. Ron was my stepfather, as I said, and I've known this man for more than 30 years, but this was the first time he had told me anything about the pain of growing up in the Jim Crow South. my stepfather with Ron sitting in the back seat of his um, parents' car and they get pulled over by the sheriff. They're driving north and they get pulled over by the sheriff and uh, and so his father is sitting in the front seat and he turns and he looks at him as the sheriff is walking to the side of the car door and he says, don't say a word. Ron was sitting in the back seat as his father pulled the car to a stop at the side of the road. His father had told him to be quiet before, but this was the first time Ron felt the words reverberate to the pit of his stomach. 
Moments later, the sheriff stood over the well-appointed Chevy sedan, complete with all the modern features you read about in the magazines. So we go back into the car. The sheriff stood over the well-appointed car with all the modern features in the magazines. And the sheriff says, where'd you get this vehicle? What are you doing here? And who are these people with you? The sheriff asked his father, and Ron's father answered, it's my employer's car. He pointed to his wife, sitting upright and expressionless in the passenger seat. He pretended that he didn't know her and said, this is my employer's maid, and that is her son in the back when driving them home. The sheriff took a long, hard look at Ron's mother and then angled his eyes to the back seat. A young Ronald sat tight-lipped, too afraid to turn his head or even take a breath. Where's your hat? The sheriff barked at Ron's dad. Hanging right up in the back behind me, the back seat officer. The sheriff waved, all right, move on. As they drove north across the Tennessee border, a sad, eerie silence hung in the air. The jovial conversation they were having right before the sheriff pulled them over had stopped, dead. And although there was no discussion about what had just happened, the gravity of the situation was clear. Ron watched Daddy and Mama exchange knowing glances, and then he turned his head to look at the black, unassuming cat that had been hanging next to him in the back seat ever since he could remember. It wasn't until that moment that he realized why he had never seen his father wearing it. Mama wasn't a maid, and Daddy wasn't a driver. He had a good job at the railroad, and this was their family car. Until that day, Ron never paid attention to that cat, but now he realized that it wasn't just any hat. It was a chauffeur's hat, a ruse, a prop, a lifesaver. During the Jim Crow era, the chauffeur's hat was the perfect cover for every middle-class black man pulled over and harassed by the police. If Ron's father had told the sheriff the truth, that he was driving his own car and that they were family on vacation, the sheriff wouldn't have believed him. He would have assumed the car was stolen. In the event that the sheriff did believe it was Ron's father's car, the rage and jealousy he may have felt at the thought of a black man owning a nicer car than maybe he could have afforded, could have triggered a beating, torture, or even worse. From that day on, Ron noticed these hats strategically placed like unarmed weapons in the back seat of nearly every black man's car. But it wasn't until I started this project that he shared these stories with me. It was only then, at the age of 46, that I realized I had earned his trust. This was a huge accomplishment because after what he and most black men of his generation had lived through in this country, he felt he couldn't trust anyone. And it wasn't until I started this project that I understood why every time I left for the airport, after visiting my parents in Ohio, Ron would try to load me up with food for the trip. And I'd say, no thanks, I could just pick something up at the airport. But it wasn't until I started writing this book that I hadn't realized what a privileged statement that was. Black folks of Ron's generation never left on a trip without taking food because there was no guarantee they would be served anywhere. Ron knew intellectually that times had changed, but his survival instincts never left him.